Welcome, everyone, to Positive Talk. My name is David Sturtouch. I am the founder of Survivor to Hero, where we help you rock your hero story. And today, we are going to be continuing with the Thrive model. We are starting, we'll be starting on Signpost 6. But before we do, let me just recap my credentials, just in case you're joining us for the first time, so you can get to know me a little bit. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm the founder of Survivor to Hero. I am a PhD candidate in psychology with concentrations in philosophy and cognitive neuroscience. I also am a licensed professional counselor in the state of Colorado and a certified professional coach. Now, everything today that you're going to be hearing, I must stress, is not therapy. This is more of a coaching, wellness, and self-help model. The Thrive model is being read from What Doesn't Kill Us, The New Psychology of Post-Traumatic Growth by Dr. Stefan Joseph, PhD. So Dr. Joseph is one of the uh, leading readers, researchers in this, and uh, this book, What Doesn't Kill Us, New Psychology of Post-Traumatic Growth, I, I recommend that you pick it up. Uh, I am going through this and reading and then adding some of my own personal expertise so that if you are struggling from trauma or trying to heal your life, sometimes People have PTSD or just a difficulty processing sometimes words and reading, taking time to read. So by, I wanted to create an opportunity for you to be able to listen to this model. And we're on signpost six. So there are uh, previous episodes starting from uh, episode one, which is what we started the series with. And that covers signpost one, which is, I believe, four episodes. Uh, then we move into signpost two, signpost three, signpost four, five, four and five. We're, we're even shorter. And so they're, they're pretty consistent. Uh, two and three took us a single episode. So you can move through these pretty quickly. Now, if you can, if you're picking up right now, just jumping in, that's, a, that's okay. Uh, you can go back and re-listen and start from the beginning or jump on episode two. Um, where episode one, we're kind of introducing it. Episode two, we're really jumping in, creating a safety net. Episode three, moving in on the additional signposts. All right, uh, now, so signpost six, or the sixth step in the Thrive model, is called expressing change in action. It's not enough to intellectually reframe our experiences in positive terms. We must also express our growth in new behaviors. In short, we have to put growth into action. Go back over your answers to the PWB PTCQ, see Appendix 2, and that's the questionnaire. Uh, you would need the book uh, for that part. And think about your examples of things that you actually, that you did, that show that you accepted yourself and acted autonomously, exhibit, exhibited, uh, purpose in life, and improved your relationships, in which you achieved a sense of mastery and found your way to personal growth. Also, think about the ways in which you already express how you've grown. It might be little things that you begin to see to change. I spoke up about, uh, I'm sorry, and uh, so here's another example, it quotes. I spoke up at a meeting at work yesterday, even though I knew others would disagree with me because I believe in this issue. I wouldn't have done so bef that before. So that's an example of how someone is, has grown. Here's a few more. When I got home last week to find the water heater leaking, I didn't panic but dealt with the situation in a very efficient way. I surprised myself that I was able to do that. I cooked a very special dinner for my husband on Sunday to show him how much I loved him. I won some money on the lottery, and I gave half of it to the woman collected collecting for cancer. I was nervous about it, but I took a chance and enrolled in an evening class to learn how to paint. I took part in a charity run to raise money for the children's heart appeal. So those are some examples of uh, things that you might have listed in the journal or doing that exercise. <laughs> Pardon me. All right. Thinking in terms of, uh, we're going to continue on now. So thinking in terms of concrete actions can help uh, make your growth real rather than something that just exists in your mind. Observe the little things. Use them to learn about yourself, your strengths, abilities, 
and talents. It is useful once a week to take time out of uh, take time to reflect on your past week and find examples of how you succeed in translating your growth into action. Examples may be similar to what was listed above. This exercise will allow you to start thinking about your week coming up and what things you have done this past week, no matter how trivial they seem, that demonstrate that you are becoming more self, more self-accepting, more autonomous, finding purpose in your life, focused on deepening your relationships, masterful of your situation, and open to personal growth. What are those things? And what things do you think next week would demonstrate these strengths? In this connection, you might find it helpful to think about expressing yourself in new and creative ways through activism, advocacy, and other forms of commitment to personal or social action. Are there things that you can do that uh, use your experience for the better of others or your family or friends or your community as a whole? By focusing on these six signposts, taking stock of where you are in your journey, finding hope within yourself, actively reauthoring and st- the stories that you tell yourself, identifying your changes, valuing, valuing your changes, and finally, actively expressing these changes in your community, you will find that your post-traumatic growth is beginning to take root. Now, that is the end of signpost six. Surprise, surprise, right? It was just a few minutes. And uh, that was about expressing change in action. Now, I think Dr. Stephen Joseph means very well with these six signposts, and the signpost six, to me, felt a little short. So I'm going to share with you uh, some of my own expertise of things that uh, really can help you kind of take root in your life and a few more changes about post-traumatic growth. But before I do so, I'm going to go over Appendix 1 again, and these are common problems associated with post-traumatic stress. Now, you may or may not have experienced these, but I find it's helpful to kind of, or to just revisit from time to time some of these challenges so we can see, I've created a baseline and see how we're grown or uh, where we're currently experiencing these. And... Um, I, gave, I did one of these for me. Uh, I, I shared where I was on these, so I'm going to do the same in this one. Uh, so previously I shared if, was some of these symptoms if I was still experiencing them. And over I've while we've been doing this, I've also been going to my own therapy because as a therapist, it's, I find it's very helpful to process therapy. And one thing I forgot to mention earlier in this podcast, I work in the emergency room doing crisis work uh, for mentally... Uh, people who might ha- be having issues from a mentally ill place or mentally a uh, crisis, a mental health crisis. There we go. <laughs> so either they're suicidal, homicide, or gravely sedated due to disability or the ER doctor's concern and would just like them to talk with somebody. And that is always an option. If you're in crisis, you can always go to the emergency room. Uh, a crisis center also may be in your area. In Boulder, we have them. We have one uh, called the walk-in clinic. Uh, crisis intervention services. They're all over the Colorado area now. And that was to address immediate needs of mental health for people. Okay, so let's let's take it a step further. Let's look at now um, what are some of these common problems associated with post-traumatic stress. Now, um, there's really, as he actually mentions, there's no right or wrong way to react to adversity. And people, you may not have all the problems listed below here, and you might have some just to a, to a certain degree. This is just an, a little example of some common problems associated, associated with post-traumatic stress. All right, so let's start with intrusive memories. It's the beginning. Intrusive thoughts, feelings, or images that seem to come out of the blue. Often they can be about uh, what happened during the trauma, and they might be unsettling or disturbing. Uh, I currently don't really have intrusive memories. Um, occasionally, usually it's more just life stress. And that is something that PTSD people, uh, a fine line, and that's where therapy is helpful to determine when sometimes you lose that balance between what's life and what's just, what's post-traumatic stress. All right, so vivid dreams and nightmares, uh, traumatic 
or traumatized people may have dreams that are upsetting and disturbing. Often these two will be about what happened. Consider this description by Adrian Tempani, one of the people who was caught up in the in a crush at a football game in which 96 people were trampled to death. I was struggling with a reoccurring nightmare of watching people having the life squeezed out of them, of the screaming and crying, of the sounds of bones breaking. So that person um, had a very vivid memory. Sorry, that was very dramatic, but you get the idea. Now, um, vivid dreams and nightmares can also be other things. They can just be, and sometimes often in metaphor, if it can happen years later. And this can be events in your life that have a similar feeling, that same panic feeling, but may not be related to the trauma. That's actually your body and mind's way of just trying to process some information. But it's it's noticing a trigger, and you just also might have a heightened nervous system because you haven't quite had a chance to, or haven't done the work uh, like EMDR or therapy. And um, this this model will help you through that, but I do recommend doing therapy as well, um, especially initially after the event, like when we had the Vegas issue. Or the issue, I'm just going to call it what it was, Vegas Massacre. All right, uh, flashbacks. Traumatized people often experience flashbacks, which cause them to feel as if the event is happening again. Consider this description by Anthony Brown, a writer and illustrator of children's books, whose mother came home one day and found her father, who had been in World War II in a frenzy, wrestling on the floor with a vacuum cleaner. When he came to, he thought it was a German. So that is an example of, and this is where a veteran's experience this um, more often than than most PTSD, but sometimes like where the event, where you're reliving the event. Now, um, with sexual assaults, this can also happen. Now, when a flashback is happening, it's very difficult to to, um, to explain, uh, identify reality and the flashback. So to the person, the flashback's happening. It's actually happening right then. They're reliving it as if it was happening the first time. So the brain is processing. Now, the great therapeutic treatments like EMDR and CBT and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, uh, even yoga can um, help process some of those out, give you a way to kind of begin to create space between the memory and actual events. But it's just the mind, that pattern, it was so intense that the mind's still playing it out. And so um, that was an example of World War II, someone who um, from World War II. All right, hypervigilance. Um, and also myself, I don't really have flashbacks anymore. Uh, all right, hypervigilance. Trauma survivors may th- find themselves on the edge and alert to danger. This reaction makes sense in the midst of trauma, as it helps to keep humans safe. But once switched on, it can take a while to switch it off again. And thus, survivors find themselves consistently or constantly on the lookout for signs of danger. They may even see a threat in things that appear to be innocent before the trauma occurred. So uh, if you've ever been around someone who's got PTSD or you have it yourself, uh, you may find yourself or them uh, sitting where they can see the exits. They're back to the wall uh, because it feels a little safer. No one can sneak up behind you. Things like that. Uh, now I still I actually have a lot of hypervigilance when a sound, when shadows or cars go, when cars go by and cast shadows or light shifts those things catch my eye and my attention and I'm I'm very hyper aware of my surroundings I've actually found that can be a great gift it can be a little distracting and uh, often seem a little bit like ADD but I've actually learned to attune my attention to not only the conversation that's happening but also these other events that are going on. Uh, it can be helpful. Uh, so being able to sidestep or open the door for someone just because they saw them out of the corner of my eye, and some people are very shocked by the courtesy, uh, but it's also just using the hypervigilance to make my world better as well, as well as other people's. So that's an example of what he was talking about in Signpost 6, about how to use, uh, impact your community, give yourself a sense of autonomy by using hypervigilance as a way to uh, make my interactions with the world make it a, a better situation, you know, be kindness or just being aware of potential dangers or others who are in crisis. It helps me feel more control in my life. 
All right, so then we've got the increased startle response. And the increased startle response is survivors of trauma might find themselves a little jumpy and easily started by sudden movements, like a car backfiring, firing, or door slamming, or a phone ringing. Now, the startle response, if you're experiencing this, does decline over time, but you do need to kind of sensitize yourself. If you're stressed out or sleep deprived, that startle response can be higher. So only on the rarest of days do I ever have that. Mental avoidance is the next one. Trauma survivors often try to push negative thoughts away and not think about what happened. Uh, so instead of pushing away, once you've done the therapeutic work and you're moving through more of this coaching, the wellness work, uh, like if you're going for a walk and these, these thoughts, intrusive thoughts show up, instead of trying to avoid them or avoid talking about things or avoid situations, just focus on what you're doing now. Acknowledge those feelings showed up, but then bring yourself back. And that, so I don't, you don't need to push things away. You can just be, come to the present. And that's the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy uh, really works a lot with that through the meditations and the processing. All right, uh, behavior avoidance, very similar where you try to avoid, um, where you might be feeling shaken up, distressed or on edge or jumpy, and thus avoiding certain reminders of thoughts, feelings, or conversations associated with the trauma uh, or people or activities might be associated with it. Um, emotional numbness is the next one. Following a trauma, there can be a survivor can feel detached or withdrawn or have difficulty experiencing emotions. Many survivors often shut down mentally and emotionally and have trouble remembering what happened. They feel cut off from others and sometimes are unable expressing loving feelings. Now, um, I've really ne never met a survivor who didn't have this to some degree. This is just fear. Uh, often it shows up in relationships, even after you've done the work. And that's where you just have to learn to kind of ease into it. Seeing a therapist or working through where the coach can help. But also just communicate and be honest with a partner if it's that case. Um, you often are feeling things. It's just more fear shutting it down and denial. The next is social withdrawal, where uh, retreating, it's very similar, where you tend to have, um, just kind of hide away in your little sanctuary feeling that other people do not understand you, etc. And that is really what a lot of this channel is about. Post uh, positive Talk is about breaking mental stigma and survivor to hero, but we're also about looking at things from a positive side. So when you're socially drawing, it's, it can be a time to introvert, uh, you know, if you be a little introverted, read books, watch your favorite shows, uh, journal. But then I really challenge you to do something where you're around engaging with people, whether it be yoga, going to the gym, going for coffee, uh, calling up a friend just to socialize a little bit, joining a club. And if you really struggle on meeting people in general, I really recommend Toastmasters. And I know that may sound strange, but when you're trying to overcome anxiety, giving speeches is one of the people have a lot of anxiety about that. So Toastmasters gives you practice and it's we're in a supportive group of people where you get practice speaking and it will help you downregulate a lot of those uh, PTSD-like symptoms. So uh, anxiety tends to be another one, and that's exactly what we're talking about. Feeling panicky or faced with, when, with reminders. Some people end up having to get on medication if it's really severe, but I recommend, even if you're on medication, to work on anti-anxiety techniques, stress uh, release breathing techniques, or challenge putting yourself in situations like Toastmasters, because that will actually help you regulate over time, the anxiety medication, you can build tolerance and they've got some addiction factors. So we really have to be careful and doctors are very cautious about prescribing it and because you can become dependent. Sleep, some people have sleep disturbances. Now I still have the anxiety and occasionally social withdrawal, but you've now heard how I counter that. Sleep disturbances, waking up or difficulties falling asleep or staying asleep. I still have that from time to time, at least two to three times a week. Um, I find when that happens, if it's really can't fall asleep, then I go and get a glass of water or have some warm tea. And then I'm usually up for 15 minutes, maybe an hour tops, and then I go back to bed. But because I got up and took control, I feel still feel pretty rested in the morning. So then there's shame, guilt, sadness, grief, irritability, anger, and physical problems um, like fatigue and uh, shallow, rapid breathing, uh, loss of interest in sex. Now, um, things like that, feeling physically ill or nauseous, physical stuff, again, that's somatic. I recommend seeing a somatic therapist, a massage therapist can help. Uh, the irritability, guilt, sadness, grief, um, anger, 
that those are complex emotions and i recommend just having a therapist and just talking those out now you can also just process those out in things like running and just feeling and journaling but you have to feel it and that's the that's the important part so we went over my 20 minutes just barely but uh those are some suggestions i wanted to kind of give is looking back finding the baseline and then using these negative experiences as a way or negative symptoms those st stress disturbances to overcome you can use those as signposts things to work on like he was saying a six signposts well i hope you enjoyed this series that concludes the post-traumatic growth what doesn't kill us the new psychology of post-traumatic growth the thrive model by dr stephan joseph stephan joseph phd uh, this is a really easy read. I recommend picking up it on Amazon and you can listen to these as many times as you like. Just feel free to pause them and journal or do whatever exercises you need in between. I try to keep them around 20 minutes just to make it bite-sized. All right, this is David Startouch. Thank you so much for listening and joining us for this episode. Namaste.